Les interviews magiques de Marcus Major. Hi everybody and welcome in this new magic interview and I'm so excited about this interview. Okay, I'm excited but I don't know why I'm smashing the desk, sorry. And that's the reason of the intro, I hope you liked it. But it's a way to say that uh, this interview is one of my holy grails of the interviews on this channel. And I can also tell you that this interview comes directly in my top three of the interviews. And no, I won't give you the other names of the top three. Usually in my videos, and as you can see, I'm always relaxed. But in this one, I can tell you that I was really stressed. Because for me, as a magician, it's like meeting Michael Jackson. And you're about to see that, where I cannot even pronounce the word, unfortunately. The first time I saw Jeff McBride, it was in a show in the French television called Le Plus Grand Cabaret du Monde, or in English, Le Plus Grand Cabaret du Monde. And I said to myself, oh my God, this is real magic. I was really hypnotized by a so great act. Well, let's watch the interview and I'll see you after that. Thank you a lot, uh, Jeff McBride, to, uh, to, to do this interview. I'm uh, very impressed uh, to see to meeting you and, uh, and to make this interview because uh, you are one of the first magicians I, I know. Uh, I was not a magician yet and uh, I was already really, really impressed. Uh, so um, uh, it's one of my uh, interviews where I'm very uh, nervous. Um, so um, Usually, I don't use questions um, that, um, that, that are mentioned on the uh, internet, for example, Wikipedia or something. Yeah. But in this time, I will do an exception because I saw something um, because you are one of my favorite magicians in the world. But I saw that you played in two of my favorite movies uh, since uh, always. And it is Leon and Boomerang. And I didn't know that. And when I saw that, <laughs> I said to me, oh my God, that, that's not possible. Did you, How did it happen? Did, did you also, see, well, I have a very good casting agent. Did you see me on Star Trek? That's another... Yes, yeah. but uh, unfor 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 uh, unfortunately, uh, unfortunately uh, I'm more a fan of Star Wars than Star Trek. <laughs> uh, okay, and... Uh, my earliest movie was called The Last Fight with Roberto Duran, and I think I made that when I was in my early 20s. And I think that uh, a magician is an actor playing the part of a great magician. That was the inspired quote by Jean-Eugène Robert Houdin, mm -hmm. who said an, a magician is an actor playing the part of a magician. So I think in order to be a great magician, you have to study acting mm -hmm. and theater. And I think that's what set my show apart from many other magic shows, is that I had a basis in theater mm -hmm. and in pantomime and in dance and mask work and kabuki theater and ritual theater and it's all these different elements that made my magic different so one of the things that we teach at the magic and mystery school uh, is that a show must have a theatrical storyline to it and magic tells a story even if we don't think we're telling a story we're still telling a story you know even if a person just does a magic trick well that's a story about a person just doing a magic trick mm -hmm. and i learned early on in my career that in order to really go deeper into the art of magic i had to learn the art of storytelling and acting and some of the best magicians in the world have explored that area david copperfield who is arguably the most successful magician in the history of planet earth what set him apart from other magicians is the storyline the drama, the comedy, the emotional impact, the connection. There was characters in his numbers, the early vignettes that he would do. And still today in Las Vegas, David Copperfield is on stage as a storyteller, telling stories about his family, his father, uh, toys he had when he was a children, things that move him emotionally. If you watch a David Copperfield show these days, it's very much like watching Steven Spielberg movie. You're looking at close encounters of a third kind when you see the giant spaceship appear. You're looking at Jurassic Park when you see the giant uh, dinosaur, Tyrannosaurus, appear. His, uh, 
He is inspired because of his background in musical theater and drama and cinema. Those are his inspirations. And I grew up watching David Copperfield, you know, and he's a friend of mine, and I get to spend a lot of time with him in Las Vegas. And it's the storyteller that is the master magician. Uh, when you see Penn and Teller, they're telling stories, personal stories, political stories, humorous stories, serious stories, dramatic stories, but each piece that they create in their show has a story. It's much more than a trick. It's, each piece has elements of theater. If you look at Teller from Penn and Teller, not only is he doing the television show Fool Us, but they're also doing shows every night in Las Vegas. And then he flies to Chicago to work on, he's working on Macbeth. Mm -hmm. And he did Shakespeare's Tempest. Mm -hmm. So he's working on reinterpreting the greatest storytellers in the theater with incorporating his vision and his magic. So I think magicians, more than being technical, are storytellers. And I'll give you an example. Uh, if you look at, uh, I was at FISM in Beijing, the magic competition, and there was great manipulators. And there was, from Hungary, Soma, the Hungarian Manipulation Act. Mm -hmm. and, the diff and why he won first place is because his show told a story, mm -hmm. a story of a man coming in from nature. You hear the birds and the trees. And then he comes into the city and there's technology overwhelms him, the phones and the coins and all the, and then at the end he gets to go home and his little suitcase friend and the newspaper comes back together. And then you hear the bird noises and you realize he's outside of the city again and completing the circle of, of being able to become a master of his own sanity and cutting through the technology with his magic. And that's why he won instead of manipulators that just produce cards. Mm -hmm. Produce cards, produce cards, produce billiard. Why? Mm -hmm. Well, it's the story of a very talented young person doing manipulation. Mm -hmm. But people want deeper stories, I think, especially with magic. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have a lot of inspirations uh, in your shows. And one of the, your inspirations is the Kabuki theater, mm -hmm. so the Japanese uh, theater. Um, can you explain why did it influence uh, you in, in your shows? Well, I was very drawn. I was a little kid when I was young, and I was kind of bullied. So I took up martial arts. I took up judo and aikido, yeah. and then later taekwondo and goju ru. So I've always been. Maybe it's in my DNA. I've always been interested in specifically Japanese mm -hmm. theater and martial arts. Mm -hmm. And when I was 16 years old, I had the extraordinary opportunity to travel to Japan as an opening act for a, a Latin rock band, a salsa band called the Fania All-Stars. And I was 16 years old, I had to leave high school, and I had a dove act, I had to rent doves in Japan, and I was working on huge stages opening for a rock band, and I saw Kabuki Theater for the first time, and something inside called to me. It was the makeup and the theatrics and the costumes and the wigs, and it was larger than life. And this was right around the time in um, in the 70s and early 80s where the glam rock was really big. So it was about costumes and makeup. And today it's, you know, rock is about being very, you know, natural and all that. But back at that time, it was David Bowie doing Ziggy Stardust and Aladdin Sane, Kiss, um, Alice Cooper. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, how theatrical can you make your show? Mm -hmm. And I went, okay, I'm going to work on the makeup and the masks and the wigs and the costumes and pantomime and drama and dance and theatrics and fire and put all of these theatrical disciplines together. And that's what set me apart from the other magicians. And also the piece that I do, Transformation or Hall of Mirrors, where I have the struggle with my identity through the mask, there was never really a piece like that in magic before where it was extraordinarily dramatic. Most magic was just a magic show. And then there was Copperfield telling romantic stories. And then I went to the opposite direction, telling kind of horrific stories and, you know, struggle and uh, with my ego, with my identity. Mm -hmm. So I think that uh, really was inspired by the Kabuki theater and also great mimes, pantomime artists like Marcel Marceau. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, one of my favorite uh, magic books is... Ta-da-da! Oh. 
the show doctor. Yeah, the world, yeah. And and I think I think I'm pretty sure that every magician should read it uh, because it's uh, it's really awesome. It's uh, there there are more advices than uh, magic tricks, but mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I think this book is really 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 amazing. Yeah. Well, of course, we are not co talking about all the points. That's not mm -hmm. uh, the, the objective of the question, but. Um, I want to ask you about two points in the in this book, and um, one of the points is you wrote about about the the standards and um, and uh, uh, the standards in the show. Who decided to make something like that or more like this and so and something? And it, uh, I I see it personally in the domain as a photography of video where they some people say the rules cannot be broken. And um, what do you think about that? Uh, Do you think that indeed the rules don't have to be broken or uh, to, to reassure to people or something or to do the opposite and to uh, to try to give a, a breath of fresh air uh, to the public? What do you think? Well, about? I think it's both. I think where there's there's three levels of learning, pre-conventional, conventional and post-conventional. When you're a young magician, you have to learn the different uh, effects and the different methods and all of the different elements that make magic. Then you have a capability to go out there and actually perform magic as a generic magician. Mm -hmm. And then after that, innovation. Because I think it's the same with a piano player. I mean, you just don't go innovate. You have to learn the notes. You have to learn something about the piano. And you have to learn the notes and the melodies and then harmonies, and then you can compose your own original. But I think, and, and, and Eugene Berger was very much a, uh, Uh, involved in a big conversation with originality and innovation versus imitation. And I think magicians kind of have to imitate first before they innovate. Mm -hmm. I think they many magicians don't work with a teacher and they get very sloppy technique and they 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 make excuses that they don't want to learn the old ways. Well, there's a lot to be learned from learning the, the techniques and learning the history of magic as a way to, to make a positive progression towards creativity and innovation and making your magic unique. I think you have to learn the rules, play by the rules, and then break the rules, mm -hmm. not just break the rules. Mm -hmm. I think you have to learn good formulas, like a cook needs to learn recipes before they innovate new things you just don't go throw contents in a pan and hope for a great meal you have to learn the techniques you have to learn baking and you have to learn how to you know prepare different foods and then combine them together and that's the same thing about learning scripting learning technique learning movement learning drama learning audience management techniques all of these things go into magic but now there's so much attention like oh i'm just going to take a trick and put it on my instagram mm -hmm. and i'm not going to add anything to it because i just want to get hits and likes and, and 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 subscribers well lance burton says a million hits on youtube doesn't make you a good magician a million hits makes you a celebrity mm -hmm. makes you famous but it doesn't make you a good magician Good magicians are spending more time practicing than putting up crap on Instagram. Yeah, indeed. So that's, you know, spend more time learning your technique, learning your history, and you become a great magician. Mm -hmm. The best magicians are the ones that practice the most and do the most shows. Mm -hmm. And those are the ones that are also innovating. And those are people like David Blaine. Those are people like Penn and Teller. Those are people like David Copperfield that are doing the shows, but they know their history. They know their craft. They know the theater of magic. They're not just trying to just take tricks and throw them at their audience. Mm -hmm. And that's why there's a lot of people that are kind of flash in the pan, you know, especially on the internet today, mm -hmm. that are just trying to get famous by throwing magic at the public. Yeah, yeah. I agree. I agree. Um, and uh, my second point about the, the book, um, you you spoke, uh, you, you wrote about uh, creativity a lot all along the, the book. Um, but my question is, How do you boost uh, your creativity uh, to, to, to make so beautiful things in your shows? Uh, to boost your creativity, you have to look outside of magic. You have to look to cinema, to live theater, to art, to music. Um, you know, that's, uh, again, I go back to um, David Copperfield and Penn and Teller. Mm -hmm. 
you know, they're at the top of their game. They're doing more television shows and more magic shows than anyone in the world. Uh, people seem to like it. They're getting lots of money for it. And they're, they're looking outside of magic. Also, uh, well, let's say Penn and Teller look to politics. They look to pop culture. They look towards um, things that inspire them, like Teller looks to Shakespeare to inspire him. Uh, um, David Copperfield studies cinema. He's very, and his magic is very influenced by cinema. You look at David Blaine, he's looking outside of magic into more of these techniques of the fakir, mm -hmm. of the austerities of, of, of people that walk the edge of doing things to their body that are, you know, he's a survival artist doing, you know, being in ice and starvation and sewing his lips and regurgitation. These are not things that are in the center of mainstream magic. They're at the fringes of magic. They're on the outside edges of magic. And places where the outside edges blur are, are, are lands like India, where there is conjuring, and then there are kind of these holy austerities of being buried alive, of holding your hand up for four years, of not cutting your hair, of not eating for weeks on end, and 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 all and uh, th those are areas that you know alternative performance artists like David Blaine are looking into. So if you want to be a great magician, I think you have to study the deep history of magic, but then broaden your horizon and look at culture and art in general. Okay, and um, there is a question I like to ask always in my interviews, um, and you gave um, uh, a part of the, the, the answer, but how do you think magic these days? Is it good or bad? Is it better or, or worse than uh, some years ago? What do you think? You know, uh, you... Max Maven wrote a book called, I think it's called The Priory of Magic, where it's all quotes through history for the past 200 years of every, every age, there's famous magicians in print saying, this is the end of magic. It is, it is totally over. It's all been exposed and, and there is no more good magic and we might as well say goodbye to magic. So there has always been people saying that magic is on the decline. But as we can see through pop culture, magic is on the increase. Now, magic is uh, very controversial on YouTube because there's so many people exposing magic that they did not invent, that they don't have the rights to, to people that aren't in a magic society or a magic club or paid for the secret, like at a magic shop, you know, to the, to the, to the creator of the effect. And they're just putting secrets out on them. And yes, is that bad? Yeah, it kind of hurts magic. I was in a television interview the other day for Bruz on television. And the woman, uh, I think her name was Melina, on the show who interviews me, she said, oh, all the secrets of magic, all of the secrets of magic are on the internet if you just look. Mm -hmm. And not all of them are on, but there are many. There's enough to make a layman think that if they had the keyword, if they know the word crazy man handcuff, they can go and be on their phone on phase three of the routine while you're still on. If you say, I'd like to show you the crazy man's handcuffs, they can go crazy man's handcuffs mm -hmm. or linking rings and be on the third phase before you're done with the first phase. Mm -hmm. And that's the fact of it. Mm -hmm. So uh, magicians have to be very careful with their keywords and the way they, you know, if I say this is the cups and balls, well, I'm going to get a tutorial of 14-year-old kids exposing the cups and balls on their YouTube channel just because they want people to email them or, or, or put a little note on their YouTube clip to say hello. Well, is it good or bad? It just is. Mm -hmm. And the more magic is exposed, the more serious magicians will have to go into books and into the history of magic and deep within their own creativity and also look outward to popular science and other culture to create new magic, new routines, new presentations, new methods to be able to keep new things coming at the audience because magic is a novel. You're an, when you're a magician, you're a novelty act. Mm -hmm. 
if you are a magician working out in the world. You're considered a novelty act, and that implies novelty. So you can't really put, I mean, in Las Vegas, there are showrooms that do shows for repeat audiences that say, if you have a bowling ball or a lemon in your show, you're not gonna be hired. Because we've everybody's seen the bowling ball trick, everybody has seen the Bill and Lemon trick, and they don't want it. Mm -hmm. And you're gonna if you're gonna be linking rings and tearing newspapers, uh, you know, people have seen this. Mm -hmm. So we have to give those things a rest, mm -hmm. and then either innovate new things or go into the old books, find ideas, combine them with new materials. Mm -hmm and create new magic. Now everybody has a Rubik's cube. It's like, stop with the Rubik's cubes, please. I don't, you know, I don't want to see another Rubik's cube forever. And, you know, and there's people like, you know, Gregory Wilson and Carl Hein, they're great with it, but it's just like too much. It's stop with the three fly already. Just stop. I don't want to see three coins fly silently. Make some noise with the coins. Oh, they, you know, they took three fly and they took the sound out of the coins and now there's no noise. There used to be noise. There used to be coins in glass, and you could hear it from the back of the theater. So, you know, <laughs> don't get me started on, like, overexposed magic. But, you know, I think people have to learn that to take it beyond. You know, the same way, you know, uh, people take uh, three fly, and they use three different objects. Oh, okay, now that's a little bit more interesting. Or give me sound with it. Um, you know, do something, do something different with than tearing a newspaper and putting it back together. Soon there are gonna be no, new, no new newspapers, right? And don't get me started on app magic. I just think people will take out their phone that people think it's electronics and magicians are fooling themselves. They might not know how it's done, but they go, it must be something with the phone. And guess what? They're right. <laughs> you know, and if that, that's the weird thing. If a layman, a lay audience, thinks they understand how a trick is done, whether they figured out the method or not, mm -hmm. they're right. Yeah. That's the end for them. If they can, then that's why Tamarez says, create all these false, false methods and then disprove them, disprove them, disprove them. And that leads people to the end of the magic rainbow. Uh, and today, because of shows like Fool Us on television, the home audience thinks that the role that they play is to bust the magician, is to figure out the tricks. And that's just the opposite of the Eugene Berger kind of mystery school approach. We don't want to engage people in, in fighting to figure the trick out. Let me see the other hand. Oh, is that two cards? Let me see your hand. Did you put that in your pocket? Are there two of them? We don't want to play that game. We want to take people out of their analytical mind and put them in a world of mystery and wonder, not engage them in a fight. We want to dance, not fight. And a lot of the shows, you know, these days are like, judging shows mm -hmm. but can i figure it out are you good or bad and that's win and lose and i don't think theater is about win and lose i think sports that's making magic sports where there's a conflict and a winner and a loser mm -hmm. and i don't think that's that's theater i don't think there's a, an audience that wins and an audience that loses mm -hmm. i think that the, the the performer and the audience have to work together to create the experience of magic which is much bigger than I figured your trick out, you suck. Mm -hmm. Or I don't know how you did that, it makes me crazy. Mm -hmm. That's why I added all the layers of theater is to kind of dissolve the, the intellectual attack of magic, the, the puzzle aspect of magic, and put it more into uh, a fantastic format that engages other senses other than just the intellect. That's an, an amazing answer, and uh, I'm very glad that you you spoke about the tutorials on uh, YouTube. Uh, I have a, a YouTube channel, and my community. I kill you. No, <laughs> <laughs> no pre precisely. My 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 YouTube community knows that uh, I hate uh, tutorials on YouTube, and there is a, a lot of discussion. No, it will need. Um, it, it kills not magic. I think in sort of way it kills a little bit magic. Well, it's, if if the people are exposing magic effects that they did not create or don't have permission, or don't know the history, and they're just throwing it out there just to get, that's questionable, isn't it? Yeah. I think. And magicians make their own reputations. Yeah. There are many magicians in the news these days that are just burying themselves mm -hmm. because of exposure 
or using uh, you know techniques that expose the magic to people. So mm -hmm. I'm not a big fan of that. Let's keep it positive. Let's keep it going. Up. Indeed. Um, you Read do the book. <laughs> Read the book. No, because this book is, is most magicians are drowning in tricks. They have too many tricks. They're trick junkies. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a thing in here called prop, prop-stitution yeah, yeah. about just being, yeah. you know, just being a prop junkie. And this teaches you how to actually perform the magic yeah. and how to get the most out of it and how to connect with your audience. Yeah. And I think if people want to study presentation and character and making a connection with the audience, I think then they're going to be interested in this book, mm -hmm. which is uh, in its second printing now yeah. and almost out. I'm not paid to say that, but I will link the in the description de below the reference of the book you have to to buy the, this book if you are interested in magic <laughs> um my next question is um uh, you do uh, you do a very beautiful magic and i think magic should be uh, like that and but what's your opinion about um, the shows who explain uh the magic tricks uh Or they are teaching uh, magic, or in a, in a funny way they are explaining uh, magic tricks when they do the the shows. Uh, what what's your opinion about that? Um, I I would have to know more specifically what shows you're seeing, but I do know that there are a lot of videos on YouTube that just expose magic for laughs, like all of the suspensions, the Chinese guys mm -hmm. that expose just just to get hits. And that's just, you know, taking kind of intellectual property that's not theirs and exposing it to, to get hits on, on the internet. And I, I don't particularly care for that. It just is. Mm -hmm. I can't get crazy about it. All I can do is focus my time on creating and performing and teaching great magic. Mm -hmm. You know, because the more exposure there is out here, the more there'll be a call for students of magic that want to meet teachers like me that want to dive deep into the magic and learn what's more than just the trick it's just the sensation of the week so I, you know, i'm taking the philosophy of my teacher eugene berger is not identifying with negative states i don't dwell on that i try to clear my mind of it and focus my time positively on teaching students magic Um, the last time you came in uh, in Belgium in 2002, uh, there was a, a student in your master class uh, that there is uh, well known over the world uh, now. Uh, is uh, is uh, Aaron Crow, mm -hmm. and um, a little fairy told me in my ear that uh, his uh, his performance was developed in this master class, uh, and now is a famous uh, star. Mm -hmm. Do you have? Other stories like that, beautiful stories like that. Other examples? Yeah. Uh, Aaron Crow came to my master class in 2002, and we worked on the Samurai Act. And then he came to another workshop of mine in Strasbourg, France, and uh, we worked on the Bowman. We came up with that together. And he's studied with me for so many years. I mean, and he is becoming more of a global success with the illusionists and he's going to be more on American television soon. So you're going to be seeing great things about Aaron. But also I have a young student that started studying me when he was 12 years old. He came to the mystery school in Las Vegas and his name is Matt Franco. And he won number one spot on America's Got Talent and now has his own show in Las Vegas. I have a, a young student named Gwenelle. Her name is Gwen, and she's from France, and she started studying with maybe maybe 15 years ago, and now she's headlining galas all over the world, and she just returned from her second triumphant run at Hollywood's famed Magic Castle, and is performing uh, her dream act all over the world, and working on new acts as well. So I have uh, you know, many uh, students that have come with a dream and my job is as a magic teacher is to help people realize their dreams and really make them a reality by helping them with the choreography and the storyline and the technique and having a critical eye. And right now I work with Skype students all over the world. Every day I work one, two or three hours a day on Skype with students from South America, from China, from Europe, from um, Canada, all across the United States. So I have students all over the world that I work with via Skype. And what's good about Skype is that people can send me video clips of their show or their rehearsal and we can do a screen share and I can go over each moment 
and give them better technique and, and, and point out things that they miss, their blind spots, and help them uh, with all of the many years of experience that I've gained from studying with masters as well. So my job is to pass on that wisdom and pass on that experience to magicians that really are serious. And if they're serious, you know, we have the online school, the Magic and Mystery School online. Every week we have an hour long class online and, and people can access that and 350 episodes anytime 24 hours a day on demand it's all there and we have incredible archives and again we help students at all levels whether they're a magic enthusiast or part-time magician or wanting to become pro or they're a pro and they need new inspiration or they're working on a television special so we have a great team at our magic school larry haas who's our dean and Tobias Beckwith, who's our business manager, and all the rest of the people of our team have all areas of expertise where we can help you with the show and the business. All right, all right. Um, I made a selection of two of my uh, YouTube subscribers, uh, subscribers to ask you to let uh, them to ask you a question. Okay. Um, so is the here is the first one. It's Sebastian the Great, the third grand grandson of the driver of Udini. I'm pretty sure at least uh, one of this information is not uh, true. But well, he asks, when are you about? When you are about to perform, what's your typical day of training and practice? Well, I'm always practicing. I always have cards in my hands, uh, you know, all day long. And one of the things I say is that shows interrupt my practice because I'm practicing most of the day, most of the time. But one of the things that I always do is get to the venue early. Like my show the other that's going to be this week, I was at the venue looking at the venue, checking all the curtains, all the lights, the stage two days ago. And I'll still get there hours before. So my preparation is to get to the venue hours before if I can. I don't get nervous, I get prepared. Next question. All right. And the second one is my uh, subscriber uh, Dalmari, and he asks, In a world where magic is becoming more and more commercial with automatic gimmicks, the tutorials on YouTube, some television programs without any ethic, um, how do you see the evolution of magic along the years? How the magicians will evolve within 10 years to propose new things to their public? Well, you gave almost a, a part of the... Yeah, but I also think in the, in the future, I mean, there's going to be a lot more magic in virtual reality. Uh, if you see um, a movie like Ready Player One, the new movie that's out, The virtual reality is here. That technology is here. Immersive technology is here. And magicians have to be able to embrace that technology. You, you, you can't fight the spread of ideas. You can't. You can only accept that and generate new ideas and new concepts by studying creativity. And again, looking outside of magic to other sources of inspiration will help people develop new magic, a new style of magic that will um, attract new audiences. Much like Marco Tempest did with his augmented reality. Yeah. Augmented reality is one step closer to the next platform, which is virtual reality. Mm -hmm. So magicians will be interacting all over the world in virtual reality within three years. All right, all right. Well, I finish always my interviews by asking uh, if you have a message to give to uh, the people who are watching, um, whether they are magicians or non-magicians. Non so so uh, a message that you, you would like to, to give, uh, uh, an advice or yeah. whatever you want. Yeah, I'd say that turn off your television, get off the internet and start studying with masters. Um, I was very fortunate that I was able to study so many years with Eugene Berger and Johnny Thompson and real masters of the craft. That magic for me is essentially a live medium. I mean, you can spend all day surfing the internet, watching magic clips on YouTube and Facebook. Turn it off. At the end of this interview, go read a book on magic. Go practice a routine in the mirror videotape the routine and then take it out into the real world and reflect upon that. Magic is about making a connection with real people in real time. And if, a, if you get anything out of this interview, it is get off the internet.
That was beautiful. That was beautiful. And um, uh, I, I think now I can check on my list uh, one of my magician's dream that was meeting you and, uh, and make an interview uh, of you. Uh, now I'm looking forward to the masterclass these uh, three days mm -hmm. and I'm very excited uh, about that. But from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for the interview. Great. It was very great. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And now we have to go downstairs and make a magic show in live time. So we have to get off the internet. Bye. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome back. I hope you liked the interview and I want to say a huge, huge thanks once again to Jeff McBride for this amazing interview. But also to Alex C who produced the masterclass in Brussels and who made this interview possible. We are coming at the end of this video, but before ending, I would like to recommend you four things. The first one is the book, The Short Doctor that you saw in the interview and that I highly recommend you. I will put the link of the description of the video, so feel free to check it and to buy this amazing book. The second one is this amazing DVD. It's called Jeff McBride Magic at the Edge. It's a three DVD set and it's really, really amazing. It was filmed at, um, at uh, Burning Man and uh, the famous Lac Tahoe. Yeah, you know the like the whole LL publishing uh, and so on. As you know, there are a lot of uh, amazing videos uh, available about uh, Jeff McBride, about coins, cards and so on. But this one, it's one of my favorites because it's diversified and the three DVDs are really gold. And my third recommendation is the site of the Magic and Mystery School where you can find a lot of interesting things and you can subscribe to the, to the site to follow um, regular videos on this site. Once again, of course, all the links are in the description below, so feel free to check it. And my fourth and last recommendation is to invite you to watch the last interview that I made on my channel to stay in the world of the Magic and Mystery School because it's the interview of George Parker, so one of the great teachers of the Magic and Mystery School. He came in 2017 for a masterclass and he was also the guest teacher uh, when Jeff McBride did the masterclass for three days in Brussels. We are finally at the end of this video. I hope you liked everything. If it was the case, feel free to share this video to everybody, your grandmother, your brother, your electrician. I don't know, why not? And I see you in the next video. Until there, take care of you. Ciao.